下一位演讲嘉宾是 Dr. Clark T. Houseworth。呃、uh, ，Dr. Clark T. Houseworth 是 Acton NetPub 学术交流与合作部的资深经理，现任美国学术出版教育委员会 Society for Scholarly Publishing 理事，积极致力于促进和参与全球学术出版行业的交流与发展。Dr. Clark T. Houseworth 的演讲题目是 Leveraging Audio and Visual Content Tools to Attract High Impact Medical Research。Welcome, Dr. Houseworth. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Can you confirm that my audio and video are satisfactory? Yes. Sure. Excellent.、Um, yeah, I'm very, very pleased to be here.、Um, I appreciate you bringing me in so I can give this talk.、Um, This is a little bit short for the volume of content, so I've done my best to、um, pare us down to the essentials for this topic in terms of、uh, what we're trying to leverage here. So I'm going to bring my slides up now. And that screen share looks okay. Yes, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Okay,、um, so as it was introduced,、uh, the topic here will be leveraging audio and visual content tools to attract high impact、uh, medical research.、Um, generally, this is a much broader topic. So、um, to get it into our time frame, I'm focusing、um, exclusively on one major visual content tool and giving you the overall strat strategic reasons for how this is going to、um, potentially fit in、um, in terms of using these visual tools、um, to attract higher quality content, to share higher quality content. Um, and thus raise your standing、um, within your journal niche. Uh, so, just a quick background to me,、uh, Dr. Clark Holdsworth. I'm senior manager communications and partnerships at Acton. Um, so I do have a background in life sciences myself. I got my doctorate in cardiovascular physiology from Kansas State University.、Um, I primarily worked with preclinical animal models and、um, models of dysfunction, such as chronic congestive heart failure.、Um, so I'm very familiar with looking to publish in this area, looking to share my science before I came over to Acton.、Um, the reason this is a popular topic that I cover is、um, in my role as senior manager communications and partnerships. I work with several.、Um, Partner publishers such as Hindawi,、um, American Society for Microbiology, American Society of Anesthesiologists,、um, in bringing these types of formats、um, to their readership,、um, whether that be video abstract contracts that we have、um, or webinar hosting contracts that we've started recently.、Um, so I go through this a lot in terms of how we've built our competencies. To provide that on behalf of a publisher or a journal,、um, so I can go over some of the challenges that you might face,、um, and then I can also go over、um, how the journals deal with it and how some of them、um, might be able to do some of this internally. So these first few slides are going to be pretty brief because I just want to、um, sort of introduce a concept that I'm all I'm sure that we're all quite familiar with,、um, and that's sort of the ABCs of what you're looking to do、um, as you progress, whether it's year one in terms of your five year plan,、um, or if you have a,、um, a somewhat more established journal. So we're looking to attract obviously higher quality papers, and with that comes higher quality research.、Uh, we're hoping to receive more citations and to thus increase our impact factor. What that looks like. Um, for each one, in terms of attracting higher quality papers, the the key to remember is that publishing is currency, and so your author base.、Um, when I was an academic myself, this is the highlight of the year. Everything is built around that because it feeds into the entire system of their success.、Um, these publications are what's going to feed into their grants, which will feed into their promotion and eventual tenure. This is where they're going to yield rewards, and then that's going to feed back into more publications, and they hope to build themselves up. Through this sort of cycle and this sort of cycle within their lab,、um, among their students, their postdocs, this type of thing. So it's the same goal for the journal is the same goal for the researchers in this initial step. Of course, what you're looking at mostly,、um, although it is being devalued recently with、um, initiatives like Dora,、um, China has its own initiatives to de-emphasize some of what the focus has been on impact factor recently and focus more on scientific impact outside of such a simplistic.、Um, Journal level metric rather than article level metric.、Um, I won't talk about that in this presentation. This is a lot of what I've called out of it. So, but just again, when you're in your impact factor tier, you might be in a niche tier. You might be in some of the、uh, broader journal tiers,、uh, like Dr. Benson discussed, and you're predominantly going to be competing horizontally there. You're looking to、um, increase your citations, increase those papers that you can attract from researchers who may go to a competitor within your tier, to in order to tip the scales slightly.
which you then hope is obviously going to bring you to a final step, which is the real progress you're attempting to make year on year, which is to increase that impact factor. And the ability here to increase impact factor, which should allow you to jump tiers. And this is how you're looking to progress vertically as you compete with people within your own tier. If you can attract higher quality science, um, particularly if you are looking to attract somewhat broader science, if that is part of your aims and scope, um, it allows you to progress vertically in terms of raising that impact factor. Again, this can be your one, two, or it could be your 10. So overall, um, and what we see with authors, because we have a huge client base that's attempting to submit um, probably to many of your journals. And so what we see in the selection process, um, as we see users using our journal selection tool or contracting us for journal recommendation services is, of course, the focus is on impact factor. So they're looking at sort of a choice one, two, three. They're trying to get maybe a trio of choices. Some people are doing um, somewhat more or less, but it's generally going by impact factor. And then among those, and in particular, if they need to go past those, what they're focused on and what they want to know from us and what they want to see with a journal selection tool is what can you do for speed? What can you do for editorial quality, which is primarily dependent on your editorial board, um, the quality of your editorial system, your ability to manage metadata, um, which goes into your production quality. So how does everything look when it's coming out? Because there's a lot of effort that they're putting into this. It's a very difficult process and they want the most value that they can get. They're looking at, of course, article level metrics. So how many citations am I getting? Not just how many citations is the journal getting. A high impact factor is great, but if my paper is not getting cited, um, it's not going to be extremely helpful. And then finally, this sort of value added features. And now this whole level applies for sphere of influence for journal editors. These are all things that you can do to improve upon your journal and help in that selection process when authors are looking between you and another journal, particularly authors that have high quality research that you're seeking. What I'm going to do focus on here now is value added features. And this kind of goes into um, point nine, I believe, point nine and 10 um, from Dr. Benson's presentation that she just had on that last side of sort of the top 10 factors. So overall, so what we're focused on again is content innovation for driving this readership. We'll go through the content supporting readership gains. We'll look at planning novel content, current trending content. I'm going to focus a bit on what we've seen from this past year. And then finally, my take-home message, which I will present to you now. And that is that innovation is all in the execution. There's a lot of great formats. There's many to choose from. Um, Dr. Benson mentioned as well that... Um, there's there's definitely uncertainty and preparedness to sort of ride that wave of what might be the next thing, which I'll cover in sort of trending content. We can look at it retrospectively in hindsight. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of that out there, but how you how you execute on this, the way you decide to do it, will ultimately determine whether any of these initiatives are beneficial to your journal or whether they're simply a time drain on your resources. So I want to go through these um, a bit one by one and sort of focus on the ways in which people can implement these. Um, the first one that we have here is highlights, which I think will be familiar to many of you. Um, this is relatively common. The reason it's relatively common is it's easily executable. This is something that can be relatively author dependent. Um, you simply need to provide the authors with resources, which I'll be going through in some subsequent slides. But highlights are doable by your author base, um, and you just need to be provide them with the resources to get um, what you expect out of them. The same goes for the plain language summary. The plain language summary being a sort of layman's abstract, um, an abstract and the type of summary that is accessible to more people. Um, very common in clinical research because they need some sort of written document that can be used to communicate with patients. Quite often, it's an obligatory um, aspect of a society's mission um, to share that information with um, patients, and something like a plain language summary suits that extremely well. So again, same as highlights. This is very doable by your authors, but you need to provide resources for them. Um, so it's something that you can implement quite easily, but you need to do it well so that you get um, what you expect back from them. Because if you don't help your authors with it, you you may find that they slip into their standard writing style and you're not really getting the value out of this plain language summary that you'd like to see. The other one here is infographic. Um, this one is a big one. Um, I think what we've all seen over the last couple of years, particularly in the clinical or medical sciences, 
is a huge boon in infographics. And they're not new. They've been around for quite a while. I think we've all um, seen them in the past. But the infographic in particular lends itself well to describing medical research, particularly when it comes to epidemiological research, um, which is what you see with COVID. A lot of this information sharing where you need to convert this scientific jargon into terms that can be understood by the public because they need access to this information, um, to policymakers, because you would hope that they take the science and make good decisions with it. Um, the infographic is very conducive to that. It's a, it's a great way for people to consume information. It's particularly good on social media um, where you want people's attention in a short time span and you want to be able to get it across to them quickly and not having to read all the content. So obviously, we probably couldn't have predicted it. This is entirely event-based because of the incident that we've had um, worldwide over the last couple of years. But infographics mm -hmm. is a great example of content that has taken off. Yeah. The next one you have here is graphical abstract. Um, your graphical abstract is... Um, also accessible by authors. Um, it's something that they can produce on. Um, but again, you need guidelines for them. You're going to get widely varying um, outputs in terms of this format if you're not providing them with some guidelines, which I'll give you some references for subsequently. Video abstract is what I'm going to focus on for the challenges. And the reason for that is that video abstracts are extremely difficult to execute on. Video uh, abstracts probably require the most expertise, and it's something that's most often not laid all in the author's lap. And so if it's something you want to go for, it can be incredibly impactful. We do these series for several uh, journals and publishers. Um, it's an incredible way to share science. It's a huge value added feature, um, again, particularly for young scientists. It's something that if they can do as part of the publication <laughs> process, it's a huge attraction, um, but it takes significant. Oh. And then what you have here is webinar, again, a similar sort of style um, where you have a, a, a visual component. Authors can be brought into this process, just like a conference here. It's something that they can be briefed on, technical checks, things to get them prepared. Oh, I need to take your shit, deliver, bro. Um, something professional. And then you have blog. Um, the... The blog is um, a highly accessible format. Again, something that authors can be trained in to operate. Okay, so moving into planning novel content. So um, <clears throat> what I want to focus on again is this it was primarily concerned about video abstracts. It does apply to others, but video abstracts are the most um, complex format that you're going to have. So you have author versus staff generated con uh, content or contractor generated content being um, what you're going to focus on for what may be appropriate for you. The challenge you have here, authors are highly talented and skilled scientific writers, but they are primarily so for manuscripts. It's the traditional um, article of record that they're trained to write for. Authors are not routinely trained, or uh, nor should they be assumed to have the resources <coughs> for non-traditional scholarly communications formats. The challenge then for journals is that on the staff side, they have limited time and resources, of course, particularly if you're new to journal, um, to parcel out to any of these initiatives that you might want to um, embark on. Journal staff also are going to have varied competencies. Sometimes you do have the components in place and proficiencies in graphic design and that type of thing, um, but sometimes you don't. And so it's going to factor into what formats you be, cho be choosing and what sort of workflows you may want to be implementing. And so the non-traditional scholarly communication formats, it's difficult to choose um, which direction you're going to go because what you end up um, battling between are these three sorts of points. Of course, you want the best possible output complexity. You want something extremely professional. If you can have um, a 3D animated video abstract demonstrating molecular interactions for um, a significant advance in the life sciences, it's an incredibly powerful way to represent the science that's being published in your journal um, and draw attention, particularly through social media. However, you're balancing that, of course, against your organizational resources and the potential contribution of your authors, which again, that potential contribution of your authors is going to vary based on what tools you are providing them with. So when you're looking at that slide where you have different options for formats, you have to evaluate the interplay um, between these factors when you want to select a format that's going to work for you and provide that added value. 
So what you see for trending content, it was dis- as we discussed, infographics have been extremely huge um, since COVID, unfortunately. That's not the reason that we want to see them, but it has been an, a very, very useful tool in communicating science during that time. Um, you see things like from the Society for Microbiology podcasts, as an example I have here. And of course, I think what you're seeing more and more is that publishers and journals are paying Uh, strong attention to their um, YouTube presence or other social media presence where video capabilities are employed. And so to focus on the video abstract briefly, the video abstract, of course, is just a video uh, presentation because normally corresponding to a specific scientific research article. And it's usually tied to the paper um, where the article of record for the paper is. A trend now is there is the potential to grant DOIs for this type of work. Um, we're working with uh, Crossref with their head of metadata for potentially developing schemas so that video content um, can be stored and assigned its own DOI so that that will become um, its own um, digital objects that you can then reference um, independent of the paper. Um, That's also something that you're going to be seeing with webinars and that type of thing. So again, metadata will be very important going forward, um, but these formats are starting to become much more robust, um, have much more staying power and be more widely implemented because they are um, falling into this sort of article of record um, loop. And so... (laughs) A low barrier um, alternative to enhanced multimodal publishing um, is the embedded video um, in the manuscript file. And so the key thing to remember here for these formats, again, this applies widely, but I wanna focus on the video abstract uh, here for time. They are going to be highly reusable. Um, You can go to news outlets with them. Uh, University press releases will commonly want to adopt them. Laboratory web pages, of course, for the individual scientist or researcher. Social media conferences, we see a lot of reuse, and you see a lot of digital abstracts going on at conferences right now. Um, Presentations such as this one, they're commonly um, utilized because then you have something that's going to encapsulate a large portion of your presentation in three minutes or less. Tenure evaluations are adopting this sort of uh, data visualization. And of course, supplementary materials are another option for it, particularly when a journal doesn't have video abstracts um, as a format type. It's also something that can be, in a more general term, included as supplementary material. The challenges for journals then are, of course, incorporating multimodal publishing in a way that enhances the communication of the research in a professional manner and supports the promotion efforts of the publisher themselves. So the ideal format for a video abstract, and this is something that seems to have been established in terms of the trends that you see in the industry, is two to three minutes, which is going to approximate to 200 to 350 words for a script. 350 words is usually pushing it because when you actually end up narrating a script, um, a voice actor is going to be pretty slow with it. And so what seems to be um, a relatively short script will turn into a relatively long narration. So definitely 350 words would be a pretty hard cap. Most commonly, it's going to be lay language and it's going to be verb intensive. So it's an adaptation of technically dense writing material. And you typically omit things that aren't necessary. Again, the video abstract is designed to share information um, that's highly relevant, um, the main points of the research. And again, this applies to infographics blogs, the same type of thing. And so there's not as much focus on the robustness of the reporting when it comes to methods, statistics, et cetera. And the ideal format, of course, would be in an, the most the most possible engaging um, and production quality and highest production quality that you can uh, master. So best quality it would be fully animated video incorporating professional narration and conceptual representations, which is something we've worked really hard for. Um, something on the lower or simpler end, I would think of it as, is PowerPoint lecture slides or a video interview um, in a simple format, perhaps through something like Zoom. Um, this is not as useful for many of the reusable formats um, that you saw on the previous slides. But the key here is to minimize restrictions um, as best you can. An example I want to give here is BMJ uh, does this quite successfully, and their guidelines include um, the obvious as short as possible and certainly no more than four minutes. They encourage it to be as high end as possible, leveraging the university. Typically, your university media departments have resources for this, or you may have a budget for outsourcing this type of production through the communications department, Um, and the inclusion of graphics and 3D animation can be crucial. 
Uh, one of the major barriers that we see for implementation and some of the challenges that the journals come to us with is resources for hosting the content. So evidence suggests viewership for native and external hosting are correlated, which means it's not entirely necessary to host natively through your platform, through your site. Um, this uh, this data was uh, from the New Journal of Physics, where there's a strong positive correlation between view counts on the native platform and their corresponding YouTube platform. So some of that correlation may be because people are seeing it in the native platform, but then choosing to watch it on YouTube. So if they didn't see it on the native platform, they might not have, have gone over there. Um, but generally, um, going to a social media platform to host that sort of content yourself doesn't seem to be damaging to the viewership. So, um, And then promoting initial standards without available examples can be really hard. So getting these initiatives off the ground um, can be a huge ta uh, challenge. Uh, one, one thing that you can get around and something that we've uh, done for clients is commissioning highlighted video abstracts so that you can get examples of what you would like your authors to have. Examples can sometimes work better than guidelines because if they see um, what sort of work they should be providing or what they should be sharing with you for this sort of content format, um, it's easier for them to align with that. And so producing a modest gallery in-house um, using your staff or outsourcing it can be a valuable way to get the initiative started um, if you are going to be leveraging authors to a strong degree in terms of dealing with any of this content, whether it's infographics, video abstracts, um, anything of that nature. And so finally, I'll close up with the challenges. So to retain their value, um, video abstracts must be flexible and not directly tied to the peer review. It makes quality control challenging then because there's um, you must go through the process with the authors and try to get the expected outputs out of them. Um, and so a key is that authors need options and support from the journals and publishers that can come in the form of um, very detailed guidelines, um, reference work, um, as we mentioned, or possibly some sort of referral to outsourcing author services agencies that um, can do things like infographics, journal cover art, um, video abstracts, any of these audio visual formats um, that you may be wanting to adopt. I think I'm a little bit over time. Apologies for that. Well, thank you so much, Clark.